want to introduce you to the guy who made me one of the happiest guys on earth uh, a day last year. Kevin, thank you so much again. Thank you. In uh, July of 1969, Dan Lukita, who was the owner of the Western Flyer, saw Neil Armstrong walk on the moon. And soon after that, he decided to name, rename the Western Flyer to Gemini. Um, see, Lukita was captivated by the space program. And he had uh, a couple of other, other fishing boats. One was named the Apollo, and the other was named the Astronaut. Um, of course, there's uh, s certain similarities between fishing and, and exploring space. It's, they're both great adventures, and they both have an element of danger. Um, but it's a strange coincidence, the name that he chose. And that one wonders if he really understood the symbolism behind the, the name Gemini. And according to mythology, um, Leda mated with the god Zeus when he disgu disguised himself as a swan. And she was also carrying the, uh, the, the seed of her husband. Um, and she gave birth to twins. And one was Castor and one was Pollux. And when uh, Castor died, uh, Pollux went to his father Zeus and said, please, can you keep us together? the two brothers together. And so Zeus created the constellation, um, the Gemini. <laughs> um, and uh, so the stars repre really represent the two-sided uh, nature of, of being, the mortal and the immortal, and the material and the spiritualistic. Um, and it's just like the story of the Western Flyer, in a way. The Western Flyer had a side that was material, where it exploited the sea, and it had a side that was spiritual, that conserved the sea. Um, of course, we all know in, in uh, 1937, the Western Flyer was built and uh, it, as a saner for the Monterey s sardine fishery. And in the off-season, the, the uh, of the sardine fishery. It was leased in 1940. It was uh, chartered to John Steinbeck for his voyage to the Sea of Cortez. Um, I don't ne need to tell this audience um, that Steinbeck and Ricketts met in 1930, and Steinbeck was really a, a fledging writer then. Uh, he was a good writer, but from, from my perspective, he seemed to lack a really good story. And so Steinbeck uh, frequented uh, Ricketts' lab, and together they roamed the tide pools uh, for hours on end. And, uh, and there was a certain alchemy in, in the mixture of them, and together they were much greater than the sum of their parts as individuals. Um, Ricketts showed Steinbeck about how animals lived in the tide pools, how they competed with each other, how they ate each other, and how environmental events like El Nino would drive some animals out of the tide pools and other would replace them, and how they might, how the, they might struggle together for existence. And um, Steinbeck, again from my perspective as a biologist, applied this learning to the stories that he told about humans and their interactions with men and with the environment. Um, they first planned, some of you probably know, they first planned to do a survey of San Francisco Bay. Um, then abruptly they decided to go to Mexico instead. Um, uh, they were both having personal problems. Um, Ed Ricketts had broken up with the love of his life or was having difficulties. Steinbeck himself was having difficulties with his marriage. And there was, was uh, the FBI was investigating him for certain political activities. And there was public outcry over his publication of The Grapes of Wrath. So uh, they had decided to go to Mexico um, instead. 
and to get far away, and they were planning on making a road trip. Um, but the logistics, as we've heard, the, the roads weren't very good down there. A lot of the places that they w wanted to visit, there weren't any roads, and they were having difficulties with the logistics of chartering small boats in, in a lot of these villages. So they decided to lease the boat, uh, the Western Flyer, instead. So this cruise was uh, really an important landmark in, in, uh, because it was the last survey of the Sea of Cortez as it was on the cusp of change. The uh, Colorado River was the major flow of water into the Sea of Cortez, and, uh, and the Colorado River Delta was just a luscious uh, 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 habitat. Uh, in 1922, when Aldo Leopold visited this, the Colorado River Delta, he called it a milk and honey paradise. Um, but when the dam was finished building, you can see what happened to the flow uh, into the Sea of Cortez. This was measured at the, at the bo Mexican-American border, and it still had to cross the Sonoran Desert. And by the time it got to the Colorado River Delta, it, or to the Sea of Cortez, it had all dried up. So what happened to that water? Well, the bounty that was destined for the Sea of Cortez was transferred to quench the thirst of the cities of the Southwest to water the farms and to light up the cities. Um, well, the crew of the uh, boat worked really hard for six weeks, and they partied hard for 4,000 miles. They <laughs> collected about uh, 500 different species bottled up in th thousands of specimens. They discovered 35 new species, and uh, and Ed Ricketts sold about $12,000 worth of the samples that he collected. Tony Berry, when he heard that, he said, "I would have charged you more if I'd known you were going to make that much money." <laughs> On April the 8th, during their cruise, they heard from locals. Uh, about a fleet of Japanese ships nearby. There were supposed to be 12 ships, uh, in about 150 to 175 feet long. There was one mother ship that was uh, about 10,000 tons, so that's about the size, probably about the size of a football field. Um, so they decided to pay these sh uh, ships a visit. Um, and this is what they, what they said. So Tony Berry's log on April 9th said, left anchorage for shrimp fishing boats. There are 12 Japs boats here, all big boats. They sure are killing a lot of other fish. John and Ricketts went out. Ed Ricketts reported in his log, located the first Japanese uh, shrimping fleet quickly. There were six or seven boats, many fish, possibly several tons per haul, which were thrown back. The Japanese saved only the shrimps. The Japanese, very obviously, will soon clean out the shrimp resources of Guaymas. The Japanese are good people, people you'd like to know, like the kind young Japanese captain. He was good people, and so were the crew. And Steinbeck, in the, when he wrote the log of the Sea of Cortez, he changed that to, we like the people on this boat very much. They were good men but they were caught in a large destructive machine, good men doing a bad thing. That's kind of a, a theme of Steinbeck. Um, this is a industrial fishing company was like a super organism whose motives and behaviors were different from the individuals within it. Um, it's the uh, emergent properties at higher levels of organization that, that he was getting at. Of course, we all know that the, uh, they published their, the, law, the Sea of Cortez in 1941. It was a, a, a log and a, a, a accompanied by a catalog of species that they found at the end. It only sold 3,000 copies. Um, I used to laugh at that. 3,000 copies didn't you know, seem like a r ridiculous amount. Right now, I'm pretty jealous over, <laughs> over selling that number. Um, there were, the reviews of the book 
were very mixed. Uh, one reviewer said Steinbeck was sandwiched in between dread, uh, thousands of dreadful little animals. <laughs> um, another said it was a Chiopino of travel, philosophy, and biology. Um, but many, most people now consider it uh, one of Steinbeck's best books. And they were trying to accomplish a huge and maybe uh, impossible task, which was to marry philosophy and biology in some kind of unified theory. And they wrote of, of the book, this trip had dimension and tone. It was a thing whose boundaries seeped through itself and beyond into some time and space that was more than all the gulf and more than all our lives. Our fingers turned over the stones and we saw life that was like our own life. Steinbeck and Ricketts even compared their voyage to that of Darwin on the Beagle. They thought it was real, that important. After the Sea of Cortez, the flyer returned to Monterey Bay to fish for sardines. In the 1940s, everything in the sardine fishery was pretty rosy. Boats and canneries were being built, and Ricketts said the canneries were increasing just like predators. They were following the abundance of sardines, multiplying and spreading up the coast. Um, the first canneries were built in the early 1900s. By 1917, there were 30. And by 1944, there were 75. Suddenly, the, the fishery crashed. And right up until the end, people denied that the crash was happening. Um, the fishermen and industry owners were opposing any kind of regulations. Anecdotally, there were still plenty of fish out there. In September of 1945, the biggest ever single day landing of sardines was landed in it was recorded in Monterey at 9,000 tons. And, but by December, three months later, the fish were gone. Experience has shown that it's hard for fishermen as well as biologists to tell where, when we're in the midst of a collapse. And some claim that the sardines just moved. This is really similar, quite similar to a story that's happening right now on the East Coast with the collapse of the Atlantic cod. Fishermen are still claiming that there's still plenty of cod out there. They've just learned how to hide better. Um, let's see, I think I missed a slide here. Ah, no. So the cannery owner Knut Hovden, which is now where the aquarium's uh, located, he owned that cannery, um, said that experience has shown us that the abrupt total disappearance of sardines is not a sign of overfishing. Don't let yourself be misled by people with lots of theories and untried ideas and who have no financial interest in the industry, but who would sacrifice one of the world's best industries, perhaps to attain personal prominence for themselves. Here's what Ricketts said. What happened to the sardines? In the same year, 1947, Ricketts said, they're all in cans. But we mustn't regard overfishing as the sole factor in the present disaster, although it's the only one over which we have any control. Ricketts had a really pretty complicated uh, explanation for what happened to the sardines. Ultimately, it boiled down to removing the large fish from the from the population. So he felt that the larger fish would compete with the smaller fish in their main habitat, and the larger fish would leave the habitat and go up to the coast of Oregon and Washington and feed up there, which had a second, a later plankton bloom. So in effect, they had two different, they, uh, ex they had an extra ration of fish. That would fuel a great reproduction of the fish and so when they'd come back down and spawn, they, they would uh, produce a lot of eggs. 
So when the fishery removed those fish from the population, they were, weren't getting that extra ration of fish, and it was just the younger fish that stayed down in the central coast that were responsible for reproducing. Um, it was a very typical Ricketts explanation. It was holistic, a little complicated, and had a little bit of uh, mysticism in it. Um, Steinbeck wrote in Sweet Thursday, the canneries themselves fought the war by getting the limit taken off the fish and catching them all. It was done for patriotic reasons, given it was in the war, but that didn't bring the fish back. It was the same noble impulse that stripped the forest of the West and right now is pumping water out of California's earth faster than it can rain back in. When the desert comes, people will be sad, just as Cannery Row was sad when all the pilchards were caught, canned, and eaten. Oscar Setti, who was the, czar, the sardine czar during World War II, was uh, complained that the, he was compelled to increase the limits on sardines by pressure put on him from the industry and the military. And um, it was a national concern. And he said the industry used their clout to limit laws and to block effective conservation legislation. And scientists were also to blame. Um, and they, the scientists were always optimistic, as we often are. And in 1950, the Herald reported a report uh, from scientists saying, fish in 50 is the promise of scientists. Then again, in 1951, scientists reported in the Herald that a substantial recovery of the sardines is taking place. Of course, it didn't take place. Um, the last sardines concentrated in San Pedro. In, and uh, in 1968, a, uh, they started using spotter planes to find the sardine schools. And in, 19, in that year, one fisherman reported that he found one large school. And he said uh, that in one night, we caught them all. The boat was sold in 1948, and it moved up the coast. Um, it was now outfitted as a, as a trawler and began trawling the bottom for Pacific Ocean perch, petrale sole, and cod. This was a really growing, the trawl industry was really growing. Um, one day, Dan Lukita, who was the owner of the boat at that time, stood on the bridge, on the flying bridge of the western trawler as it hauled up a big load of Pacific Ocean perch. As the legend goes, um, Pacific Ocean perch are a very spiny fish with an orange color. And when you bring them up to the surface from the, from the bottom, uh, the, their gas bladder expands from the decreasing pressure and it just balloons out and their eyes pop out and their stomach often pops out of their stomach. So when you bring a big load of Pacific Ocean perch up from the bottom, the net leaps out of the water like a breaching whale. So Lukita called his catch-in to the Dolls uh, Fish Packing House in Bellingham, and he uh, said, we've got a big load of, Pacific, of perch here, 50,000 pounds. The manager of the uh, of Dolls Fish House was known as Baby Doll, and uh, Baby Doll was uh, a large man, some say 300, some say 400 pounds, and he often sat on two rolling chairs. Um, so Baby Doll said, well, uh, we've got a glut of Pacific Ocean perch on the line right now. We can't use them. If you're going to bring them in, we're going to sell them for, as mink food for a penny a pound. Dan Lukita said, dang, that's a, just a waste. Um, it takes, he figured that it would take him two days to run in and back, and so it just wasn't worth it. So he released the contents of his net and, the, and those bloated fish floated out and out as far as you could see. 
and covered the horizon in a sea of red. And the seagulls converged on them from the top and the, and the sea lions from the bottom, and they had a gluttonous feast. Wow, that's, I'm, that's 10 minutes? OK. Um, so the fish were, uh, so the fishery boomed uh, over the years, and pretty soon the Japanese and the Soviets got wind of it. Um, they started from the Gulf of Alaska and moved down into Oregon and Washington a few years later, um, and this is what happened to the population. Um, they, the Japanese and the Soviets did what they call pulse fishing, and they hit those fish really hard. Pacific Ocean perch live to be around 100 years old. They're kind of like the, the uh, old trees in an old growth forest. And when they came in, when the Jap foreign fishery came in, it was like clear cutting them. And it caused dramatic changes uh, in the ecosystem, which we're probably st still not aware of exactly what happened. Um, Lukita saw the danger coming. And he bailed out of the fishery before, it ac before the collapse actually occurred. In 1962 and 63, Lukita did trawl surveys for the International Pacific Halibut Commission, who was interested in the impacts of these foreign fisheries on the halibut resource in the Gulf of Alaska. The interesting thing was Lukita saw all of the abundance of crabs up in the, in the Aleutian Islands. And he got really interested in fishing them. And he heard that there were a few fishermen up there fishing for crabs and um, that they were making a lot of money. So he outboated, outfitted the boat uh, as a crabber and headed on up to the Aleutian Islands. Um, so it was a calm day in the Bering Sea. And Jackie Ray was the skipper of the Western Flyer. Um, Jackie Ray was a quiet man, but he had this really intimidating side to him. Um, he often served uh, Canadian club whiskey uh, with tobacco juice in it for breakfast. And once he was, uh, was told, I was told that he poured hot coffee into one of his crew members' boats, boots just to get a, a rise. And he scared the living daylight out of his crew. But his distinguishing characteristic was his iron claw. He was born in Connecticut, and he worked as a young man, worked on a trawler, and he got his hand caught in between the, the, a wire as it was coming up and, and, and the trawl reel, and it cut through his wrist like it was butter. Um, and the doctors replaced his hand with an iron claw. Anyway, Jackie was a fairly nasty little guy, um, and they said he got crazy when he got, would be drinking. And one Norwegian fisherman told me, that Jackie Ray, he was a wild man. And if he got a hold of you with that iron claw, man, you were in real trouble. He could pinch your nose right off. Ray wasn't very popular with the crew. And on one morning, um, the crew was deploying the crab pots. And he didn't like the way they were deploying the, the pots over the side. And so he went out to tell them how to do it right. And he got, as he was Putting a, showing him how to put a pot over the side. He got his claw caught in the netting of the trap. And he was being dragged towards, towards the side of the boat and desperately trying to free his, his claw. And he went over the side with the 700-pound uh, trap and went down to the bottom. There was panic on, on the deck for a few minutes. And finally, somebody ran into the wheelhouse and turned the boat around. They got a grappling hook, threw it out, and gathered up the, the trap. And uh, as, as the trap was coming up, they looked over the side and expected to see Jackie Ray pop to the surface with a s curse and a, and a gasp. Instead, they saw the, tra the pot coming up slowly from the emerging from the bottom, and Jackie Ray's pale form coming with it. And as they pulled the trap up out of the water, Jackie Ray came with it, and his, he was attached to the netting with his claw. But his waterlogged body was too heavy to support, for the claw to support him, and it, he, his body dropped in. So the only thing left was his claw. Well, there's a rumor that the claw is, 
is mountain um, over Kodiak or Dutch Harbor. And I, I've looked for it, and I, I've sent pe friends out looking for it as well. But Kodiak has become gentrified over the years. They run, because of the TV show, The Deadliest Catch, they run cruise ships in there. So they remodeled all those bars. My personal view of it now is that, that Jackie Ray's claw is pro probably in a storage house someplace waiting for a reality TV show. <laughs> well, here's what happened to the king crab and the Aleutians. Um, it's a similar picture that we've seen before. That second hump is they, they depleted the, the crabs in the one area that they were fishing, so they went out and looked for them in other areas. In 1961, there were four boats in the Aleutians. In 1970, there were 41. And in 1980, there were 41. Then it collapsed. Um, there's a, they say there's a bank after this collapse that instead of giving away, if you opened an account, instead of giving away toasters, they were giving away crab boats. <laughs> so. Um, You'll notice that uh, Jackie, anyway, he, he bought a bigger boat so he could range out. The Western Flyer was too small for him at this point. He wanted more capacity. And he, he bought a bigger boat so he could range out farther and look for crabs farther away from port. Um, so there's similarities in these graphs. Um, you know, the crash, the increase is caused by an increasing number of fishermen, the discovery of the fish out there and the development of skill. And the crash is caused by too many fishermen, a lack of resilience in, in the fish population, and one more predator that adds to the pr pressure that the whole ecosystem is putting on those animals. We really can't blame the fishermen. Um, they didn't realize how many fish were out there. In fact, the government was telling us that at that point, and many scientists were saying, fisheries are unlimited. This is the fish, fish populations are going to feed the whole world. Of course, we know that now, in hindsight, that they, they didn't. Um, so anyway, now our West Coast fisheries are much better managed. Uh, but it's important not to forget the past and to forget human nature as well. So um, anyway, so. I visited the Western Flyer in 2013 um, after it had sank near Anacortes. At that point, it was a decomposing hulk, and it was crusted with mud and barnacles and veiled with a, with a uh, gauze of seaweed. So, somebody described it as a ghost ship. Then it was to towed to Port Townsend and put in dry dock. Um, when I visited it, somebody had pinned a picture of John Steinbeck to the hull as if it was a, a cask in Steinbeck's wake. Um, this reminds me, again, of the dual nature of the Gemini, the mortal vision that we see here, and the immortal side of the boat that's going to live on in the story of Ed Ricketts and, and John Steinbeck. One wonders if there's something mystical about the boat. Um, a lot of people say it has a certain mystique. Um, and I came across a piece on, on mysticism, and an uh, expert said that, that uh, in a mystical experience, um, you don't have the experience. The experience has you. And it reminds me of an Italian saying that goes, abare e chiama e marinar. And that means the fisherman doesn't choose the boat. The boat chooses the fisherman. Thank you. Questions for Kevin? We have one back here. Don. Kevin, can you repeat how much Ed Ricketts sold the specimens he collected when he was down in the Gulf of California when he came back? Yeah, I had come across the figure of $12,000. Okay. Okay.